right, today we're going to finish the section on symphony, and we'll have our first test a week from today. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the Brahms Fourth Symphony, last movement, and then we'll do some review for the test coming up. So first thing I want to mention just about the last movement of this great work is the uh, theme and variation structure. So theme and variation is the form of this last movement. And it is one, it is the most flexible, most open form of those that are associated with movements of classical symphonies. But there are some basic things that you can look for in a classical set of theme and variations. This general uh, form is based on the idea of presenting a theme then that's embellished and goes through a process of variation. A term that describes a texture that's associated with this is the term heterophony. So heter heterophony is a texture in which a melody is presented against an embellished version of itself. So this is a, a typical texture that will occur in theme variation in which the theme itself is sounding then against an embellishment of, of the theme. So some things that we'll see in a classical These ideas, and, and just um, remember that Brahms is very much influenced by Viennese classical composers and composers, you know, from before. instance you could have, what we're going to see in this uh, example is that the theme is presented in dotted half note and then you'll have variations that then are featuring quarter note and then eighth note and then introduces 16th note and then continual 16th note and then even sextuple so progressively introducing shorter subdivisions of the beat and it gives it a sense of forward movement so look for that at the beginning of, of the set then what you can look for is a variation that's in the opposite mode. So this particular movement with symphony is in the key of E minor. And so we're going to have then a section of variations that uh, shift to E major. So, or vice versa, if you have a, a theme of variation 
Newton London and Mozart work, then, which typically would be in major keys, then you'd expect to have a, a variation that's in the minor. All right. Then toward the end, very often the penultimate variation will be a variation that's in an adagio tempo. So you have a tempo change, a slower variation. And then the final variation would also have a tempo change, and it would typically then be faster. And it would often have a change of meter. And it would be the most brilliant, so it would be virtuosic. So, as I said, you know, this form is uh, open in the sense that you don't have as many expectations as far as exactly what's going to happen, like you have a sonata allegro form, which is the most prescribed of, of the classical forms. But these are some general things that you can look for, although they're not always present, but these are typical classical techniques. All right, so. What we're going to see in the last movement of the Brahms Fourth so eighteen eighty five is the date of composition. What we're going to see is that. It's a theme and 30 variations plus a coda. And it exhibits characteristics of the two Baroque types of theme and variation that I talked about last time, Passacaglia and Chacon. So the way that the theme itself is presented sounds like a Chacon because you'll hear this chord progression and you'll hear just one chord per measure. So it's presented, it's in a triple meter, it's in minor, so you should know characteristics of these two types of Baroque variation uh, techniques. And so every eight measures, So you have the chord progression as the basis for the work, but also the voice that's in the violins, the, the top line, serves as a melody that's also uh, something that's varied and that you'll hear uh, as a constant idea. And, and so when you hear that sounding with the embellishment against it, that's an example of heterophonic. So you have the original melody, and then it's being presented with embellishment. So, um, this opening set of variations animates the rhythm. So, you have the first nine variations that progressively are presenting shorter subdivisions of the beat. Then you have a couple of variations that serve as a link to um, variation 12. <coughs> and then in variation 12, you have 
um, an indication in the score by Brahms that gives the effect of tempo change. And what he does here is he changes the meter to 3-2 instead of 3-4. So the opening is in 3-4. So he changes it to 3-2, but then he writes quarter note equal quarter note, which just means that instead of having three quarter notes per measure, you're not going to have six quarter notes per measure, but the quarter notes proceed at the same tempo. So each measure takes twice as long to perform. And so it gives the, the effect of, of a tempo change there. And now you're going to have some variations that feature solo instruments. So variation 12 is a really famous um, flute solo and it's a famous orchestral excerpt. So it's still in the key of E minor. But then when you get to variation 13, it changes to E major. So that's an example of that opposite mode. And now you're going to have some more writing that features soloists and, and solo sections. So, variation 13 has oboe, oboes, and clarinets featured. And then variation 14 features the trombones, it's very beautiful. It's still an E major. And then the final variation in this section um, then it's going to uh, conclude that section in E major. at this point. And then variation 16 changes back to 3-4, back to E minor, and then it restates the theme the way you heard it at the very beginning of the movement. So you have this restatement. So you can see, I mean, for a work that's written at the end of the 19th century, this is pretty conservative as far as 
the orchestration goes. Um, one thing that I might mention here. is that the more conservative composers, because I mentioned you know, the more progressive composers that uh, kind of follow the Berlioz tradition, so that would be Liszt and Wagner, Mahler, Strauss. So again, they all kind of begin with Beethoven. But These composers would all be more conservative as far as the, uh, the orchestra that they're writing for and the general style. Yeah. So 